What a journey, my dude. We finally finished summer 2019. I got to week 10, but then other things happened. I watched other shows. There wasn't really that much going on, but we finally made it. We made it to the end of summer 2019, and I want to talk about all the shows that aired this summer. Well, at least all the shows I watched which is almost every single show this season, but I'd like to put a disclaimer out here for shows like Ene no Shobutai or Vinland Saga that have 24 episodes planned. We just hit the middle part, so they're about at 13, 12 episodes, that kind of thing. I'm not going to just judge them now. I'm not gonna say like, oh man, this show's terrible. People are gonna go back and watch this. No, 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 no. I'm going to wait until all of it's out and then I will pass judgment. I'll probably touch upon the show here and there, maybe talk about a few of the gripes I have up till this point or maybe how good it is up to this point, but I'm not going to just slam down the judgment hammer on it. I'll probably keep following it until it ends because we both know shows that start off good could potentially end in disasters and shows that start as disasters could potentially end as these fantastic cult hits. Let's start things off by talking about the shows that I think people are going to come back and watch. I think these are the shows that are going to stand the test of time and are going to be treated as absolute classics. So obviously the first show I'd like to talk about that I think will stand the test of time is Kimetsu no Yaiba. The animation is top notch, the music's great, but this show really still came out of nowhere. I didn't know this show really was going to be that much of a big hit. People were hyping it up, but I didn't feel the same levels of hype as I did for say something like Shingeki no Kyojin or even something as trash as Sword Art Online. I'm not gonna lie and say I expected this show was going to be a huge hit because I watched the first episode and I didn't think it was anything special. I thought it was just another generic shonen. Like, come on, level with me here. The guy's family gets attacked by demons and then his family gets annihilated, but his sister, his sister survives and is turned into a vampire slash demon and his sister attacks him. But then through the power of love, she overcomes her primordial instincts as a demon slash vampire and chooses not to kill her brother in an extremely touching moment only to learn that there's a secret organization underground that defends humanity against these demon slash vampire creatures. This type of storyline has definitely been played out a lot, and I mean a lot, a lot. And because of that, I went full boomer and I just dismissed this whole series because of past prejudices. I was like, oh man, D. Gray Man did this better. No, 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 no. Busuo ranking. Now that did this better. This is what scares me. Like, I'm turning into a boomer. This is literally happening. I am turning into a boomer, wallowing in nostalgia, and I'm not even that old yet. And then there was a bunch of bad publicity for the studio that animated this show, Studio Ufotable. Apparently they were involved in some kind of tax evasion in the range of $3.5 million. Not to mention the fact that they took charity money meant for people who were hurt by the earthquake that hit Japan and then they pocketed it or something. But there's some bad publicity involving Studio Ufotable. But I'm glad the show was able to rise above all of that and really cemented itself as one of the new top three shonen animes. Because ever since Bleach and Naruto ended and Boruto had really really disappointing sales Shonen Jump really lost their cash cow there so they've been trying to find these new shows to fill the void we've got stuff like Black Clover they tried really hard pushing that but I think Black Clover is not that great maybe it's because they did a recap episode at episode 3 episode 3 you did a recap episode but maybe I'll talk about Black Clover some other day it was just so entertaining to see Kimetsu no Yaiba slowly move up the ranks as the show was going on, as the season was progressing, you could see how interest for Kimetsu no Yaiba was rolling up because at first it was behind Haikyuu and then it overtook Haikyuu and then it was behind Dr. Stone and it overtook Dr. Stone. Right now, Kimetsu no Yaiba is right behind Naruto. Naruto is sitting at, I think, 1 million views. Yeah, it's at 1 million views. And then Kimetsu no Yaiba is sitting at a comfortable 950,000. So they just need 50 more thousand and they're going to overtake Naruto. I just find it kind of ironic that Kimetsu no Yaiba has overtaken Dr. Stone even though I feel like Shonen Jump has kind of thrown its weight behind Dr. Stone. Dr. Stone is slated to have 24 episodes so I can't talk about it here since it hasn't ended with the summer 2019 season but I'd like to say that it certainly feels like Shonen Jump expected Dr. Stone to be this huge series that would pretty much get everyone on board and then you would have Kimetsu no Yaiba kind of fly under the radar. I say fly under the radar but I mean like a moderate sized series maybe like a D gray man or something but dr. stone they really expected that to blow up but I think the other way around has happened so far dr. stone has really become this 
kind of moderately sized show and Kimetsu no Yaiba has absolutely blown up. I know normies that never watch anime and talk about Kimetsu no Yaiba. Where's Dr. Stone? Maybe it's a mix of the animation or maybe it's a mix of Oh My Stone Neck and the writing. I'm not sure about it, but Dr. Stone has definitely not hit that huge range of appeal that they were hoping. And before we stop talking about Kimetsu no Yaiba, they confirmed that they were going to do a movie for the next arc. So instead of a season two, we're just going to get a movie that's going to cover the train arc. And there's definitely enough manga to warrant a season two. I think they're probably going to pull a Dragon Ball where if the movie does well, if the movie does well, what they're going to do is they're going to take bits of the movie, splice it up, and then make it longer and turn that into season two, and then have 12 episodes where they actually animate it. So 12 episodes recapping the movie, and then another 12 episodes of new content. They must have realized they have an absolute cash cow on their hands, and they're going to be selling a ton of Tanjiro Katanas at an anime con near you sometime soon. I can feel a war brewing because definitely a lot of localization studios are going to want to pick up this show because this show is already so big as a Japanese show, it's going to be huge as a dub, it's going to be absolutely massive. By the time season 2 comes out, and season 2 will come out because of how popular the show is right now, as long as the movie doesn't screw everything up, even if the movie screws everything up, I think there is enough goodwill to make people come back for a season 2. Kimetsu no Yaiba is going to be one of the big three, and the last spot is probably either going to be Dr. Stone, or it's going to be Spy X Family, depending on if we get a Spy X Family anime between now and the second season of Kimetsu no Yaiba. A new age of shonen manga is coming, and the old guard is already dying. It's only a matter of time before we get a new big three. I say new big three, but One Piece is probably still going to be there, and Dragon Ball is still probably going to be there, maybe interchangeable with the third place. But essentially what I'm trying to say is, out with the old, in with the new, I am ready. The next show that I think will stand the test of time in the summer 2019 season is Dumbbell Nan Kiro Moteru. And I think that's mainly because if your hobby consists of watching a screen, whether it be playing video games or watching anime, it's really passive, right? You're not really working out, you're not playing in VR, unless you are maybe, maybe you're a VR chad. But unless you're playing in VR, you're going to put on some weight if your hobby consists of just sitting around compared to some uber chad who goes on a bike and goes mountain biking every other day or something. This show will be a jump off point that people will point back to. They'll say, hey, you like anime and you want to get in shape? Well, then go watch Dumbbell Nankiro Moteru. And I think this is a great place to start, mainly because when you watch Dumbbell Nankiro Moteru, the thing I enjoyed the most about the show is they do go to a gym, yes, but they also talk about a lot of exercises that you can do at home. They talk about, oh, if you can do these step ups and instead of bringing weights with you, just take your backpack, take your school bag, put some books in there. I got some engineering textbooks that if I lift those, I'm pretty sure I could become Uber Chad myself. Not to mention the message this show sends by ending every single episode with a joint exercise. Instead of previewing next week's episode, which I guess they do technically, they also do this one bit where they do an exercise that they showed in this episode and you can do it with the characters on screen as Machio-san counts down. Like he's like 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 as you do the plank. Slice of life wise, I don't think the show was that good. There really wasn't that much good bits of slice of life humor. It wasn't really that kind of cuteness like a maid dragon. It wasn't really that kind of, you know, normal life fun stuff that you get with from like a K-On series. This show is mostly an informational show. It's like a documentary almost. That really kind of threw me off when I first watched it. I didn't really know much about Dumbbell Nan Kiro Moteru when I first started to watch it, but I expected a more slice of life heavy show, like maybe they'd lift weights and then we'd get some kind of lewd scenes where they'd show off their butts as they lift the weights or something. Maybe they'd put the camera below the girl's butt as she does crunchers or something. They've done that in uh, the Monogatari series. And I'm not gonna lie, that's what I was hoping for, but instead I got this nice informational show that taught me how to, you know, get in shape at home. I don't need a machine, I don't need all of that. Getting in shape is not as hard as it looks. Just do these few exercises, maybe count your calories. That's the biggest deal. I loved that they had an episode about, hey, if you want to lose weight, the biggest thing isn't just exercise. The biggest thing is how much you eat. And they give some tips on dieting and they talk about how you don't want to take it too far because you're probably going to relapse if you take it too far. You want to slowly adjust your meals by counting your calories. I love the message this show sends. And the fact that they didn't go for the really, really heavy lewd stuff that they do in the manga. I believe the manga really got off because of how lewd it was, but the anime is really, really tame compared to that. And if nothing else, if this show has managed to turn one weeb into one weeb chad, then I think it's done its job. Anyways, the next show is Kanata no Astra. This show really, really caught me by surprise. I didn't think it'd be this damn good. 
Not to mention the fact that this anime is drawn in 21 by 9 and I think people can go back to this show as it's a show that's really easily marathoned. I think if you're like a Netflix or something you would want to pick up this show because every single episode ends on a cliffhanger but in a good way because these cliffhangers get explained in the next episode. They don't wait, they don't like brush it off like in Black Rock Shooter where they have this really really riveting point and then in the next episode they don't talk about it at all and when they do talk about it they're like oh yeah don't worry about it, just don't worry about it. If you want to talk about the crazy plot twist that happened in this series, just go back to the other weeks, the other conversations we've had. The only thing I didn't really talk about is the fact that Kitari's little sister ended up with Ulgar. Like, that's the weirdest ship they could have done. Okay, maybe not the weirdest ship, but to date the sister of your best friend, who's actually the clone of your best friend's wife, just might make things a little awkward. Oh, and things ended up really, really nicely when they got back to Earth. When they got back to Earth, everything got cleared up really, really well. The authorities, you know, they said that they did wrong, and then they were able to arrest the king of some country. Everything just ended off really, really, really nicely. And I think that's for the best, because I had a friend who said, like, he didn't like how this show was all about these crazy plot twists, and everything was going to come to a head when they got back to Earth. But when they got back to Earth, they just did a flashback sequence where they told us what happened and how everything played out. And it was also perfect. There wasn't really any hurdles. It was just us knowing the aftermath of the story. And I honestly disagree. I think doing that was way better than having, like, a whole other arc on their new planet Earth, on Astra. Because Kanata no Astra was good because they were in space, but the second you get rid of the space element, it's not good anymore. It's not Kanata no Astra. It's better just to end everything off here. The point of the show was to learn how these characters coexisted with each other in space and how they rose to the occasion, not about how the politics and how things would unfold in Earth. I'm honestly way happier with this ending than if they did an ending where they went back to Earth and there was this whole arc where they had to go underground and then they had to like capture the king and then they had to like do a social uprising or something. The writer had a story he wanted to tell and he told it. It doesn't feel drawn out, it feels nice and concise, especially in an industry where a ton of manga, a ton of these kind of slice of life manga, I say slice of life, this isn't too slice of life, but it's essentially like a character drama. A lot of character dramas, especially romance, they end with a non-ending. They end with like a hopeful ending where it's like, we think this is gonna happen, it's going towards this direction, but we don't know. A good example would be like, High Score Girl, I'm really looking forward to that anime next season. Uh, another good example would be something like Mysterious Kanajo X, where you expect them to kiss at the end because that's where everything was leading up towards but then at the end they don't kiss it's really really dumb the author is essentially leaving a back door for themselves so that later down the line in like 10 years or something they can pull the nostalgia card and say hey do you remember how good this series was well i'm picking up this series again i respect the kanata no astra author for ending the series and leaving no loose ends Except for the part where they have teleportation technology, and if you have teleportation technology, then what's the point of flying into space? Because couldn't you teleport to space and then teleport back? So technically as an adventure, you could come home as like a 9 to 5 job. Imagine going on a spaceship that's like focused entirely on just exploration with like weapons and stuff, and you just have to teleport home, you know, go home, do your 9 to 5, and then wake up in the morning, go like, hey, it's time for us to pick up where we left off and just teleport back to your spaceship. I mean, other than that, it was fantastic. The next show is To Aru Kagaku no Accelerator. I think this is a better jump off point for the To Aru series. The Index series, I don't think it's aged that well. I've gone back and watched Index 1 and 2, dubbed of course. I put it on in the background while I crunch some engineering calculations. And I think the old series has not aged that well. I think you're better off watching up till the sisters arc and then just watching To Aru Kagaku no Railgun. And then from Railgun just watching Accelerator. Either watch Accelerator or watch Railgun. You definitely want to finish the sisters arc. And once you finish the sisters arc, then you can watch Accelerator. And I think Accelerator was really, really good because Toma is like this super loser, right? He sucks at fighting and his fights are always so long and drawn out and he wins because of he's a hard counter to pretty much every single power. But Accelerator is set up like One Punch Man where you know any villain that comes into contact with Accelerator just does not stand a chance. So it's similar to One Punch Man in the sense that the plot happens to everyone else and then Accelerator's just there to be like this overpowered force to make sure the good ending happens no matter what. This is like if you play an RPG, like Persona 3 or something, and your main character is level 99, and the rest of your party members are like level 3. You can either power level your party members by going to a really tough dungeon and just like bringing them along for the ride, 
or you could do it accelerator slash one punch man style where you have your little party members fight it out because you want to play the game but if it looks like you're losing if it looks like the enemy is going to steal a game off you you send in your op guy you make him stop blocking you make him go in and use his you know really overpowered two hit attack that just one shots everything you can just do it that way also, mad props to the writer for Accelerator, because the plot for Index 3, I feel like it's a little bit convoluted, but the plot for Accelerator, at least the first season we got, is really really tame. I actually understood what was going on, and at the end they kind of absolved the villain by saying that she was being manipulated by the talisman. Like, it wasn't really her. She did kill herself, and she did like, kind of push her brother into turning her into a level 6, but at the same time, it was really a talisman pretending to be his sister pushing him towards turning her into a level 6. But without a doubt, the best part of To Aru Kagaku no Accelerator is the ending. The ending where he's just sitting on just some random structure in the middle of Academy City. He's just minding his own business. He's drinking his black coffee because he's really edgy and just out of nowhere a suitcase comes flying out of the sky. Some drones start shooting him. He destroys the drones and out of the suitcase some teenage girl flops out with big boobies and she's in some kind of bondage gear. Accelerator just looks at her, sighs, and is like, here we go again. That was pretty funny, that was pretty comedic, that was pretty self-aware. I like that, I like that ending. I really liked To Aru Kagaku no Accelerator. It's just kind of sad that the mainline series sucks compared to the other spin-off, like Railgun in anime form is way better than Index in anime form, Accelerator is way better than Index in anime form. I'd still say Railgun is more interesting than Accelerator though, just because the fights in Railgun are less one-sided just because like Misaka actually has to do stuff whereas Accelerator just like does that creepy laugh he does and he just one-shots everything. I thought Accelerator was gonna have a much harder time in this season in these fights. I didn't think it was gonna go full One Punch Man style because in the previous season in Index what happened was he got punched and he oh no he didn't get punched he got shot in the head and he got some brain damage which caused him to lose control of his powers unless he has some kind of RF transmitter connected to his temples. How has nobody figured out they can just like throw chaff in the air or they can like disrupt his signal and he's just gonna like collapse on the floor. No one has figured that out yet. I guess it's like top secret information or something. But why bother giving your main character a weakness if the weakness is never exploited by any of the villains? Like come on. In Index 3, someone exploited his weakness and used some like chaff and some jamming technology to stop him from getting some information from the Misaka network. And because they did that, he was able to capture Accelerator really really easily, but he was a good guy so I guess it doesn't really matter. I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying I expected higher stakes because coming off of Index 2 and the whole brain damage bit and the whole diode and he needs to rely on the Misaka network and all this irony, you would think that the stakes would be higher because people should know that he's on a time limit, his powers have all these limitations now, but despite having all these limitations, he's still as strong as he was before and he's still just kicking ass left, right and center. Oh, and before I forget, didn't he used to be this statistic mofo that would not only kill people, he would torture them slowly. I remember in one scene, didn't he reverse the blood flow inside one of the Misaka clones so that she would just implode and she would just slowly die a very, very painful death? And this is the guy that I'm expecting to believe is now this Vegeta anti-hero. You can have a character that was evil before but is good now. You don't have to say he was always good and he would just like was misunderstood. No, 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 no. Accelerator in the original index was the sadistic mofo and now he's a good guy. He changed. He wasn't always a good guy. That's what I don't like is that this series makes it seem like Accelerator was always misunderstood and that he was always just a good guy that he didn't want people to mess with him. That's why he did all this bad stuff. If we do get another season of Accelerator, I hope Lolly Misaka that is Last Order and Misaka 10032 which Accelerator has added to his harem. I hope they show up more because Rosenthal Esteru, I mean, she shows up at the end of the episode on Accelerator's windowsill and she says something along the lines of My work here is done, but my planet needs me. I hope my figures sell well because if they don't, you're never gonna see me ever again. Spoiler alert, we never see her ever again. I think she shows up in a joke like 4 coma series about Accelerator that happens at the end of the chapter, but other than that, she never shows up again. In other words, if you're an Esteru fan, then you got BTFO'd. If you thought she was maybe going to be a recurring side character to help Accelerator, then you also got BTFO'd. Esteru bros, I'm sorry. I think that's all the shows that are going to withstand the test of time, but Jozu no Takagi-san 2 is like an honorable mention just because Jozu no Takagi-san 1 was so good. 
I'm sure I'm missing a Fujo show somewhere in there, but I think that's all the shows people are gonna revisit. All right, let's talk about the garbage that people are never gonna talk about ever again. So let's start with Ari Fureta. So Ari Fureta, it started off pretty interesting, but I think the adaptation is just so bad. If nothing else, maybe it just drove more people like myself to the manga, but the adaptation is so bad. It's so terrible. I can't even put in words how terrible the adaptation of Ari Fureta is. Actually, I can. I think we had another conversation just specifically about Ari Fureta, just because of how bad it was. You can't have character development if you don't show us who the character was before the development happens. The story starts at the development, so I didn't know he was a loser. I didn't know he was rising up. He just seemed like this edgy guy. I don't know who this guy is. He just seemed like he was rising up. Maybe he was just a normal dude. Maybe he was uber chat, and now he's becoming an edgelord. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know why he was going through this arc. It was a terrible adaptation. In fact, it's so bad that I went out and read the manga, and the manga was actually pretty damn good. The manga art is really fantastic, so to go check out the manga, if nothing else, maybe it'll drive more people towards the manga slash light novel. The next one is Tsujo Kogeki Gazettai Kogeki de Nikai Kogeki no Okasan wa Suki Deska or Okasan Online. This show has actually dropped even more. I think last time we talked about it, it was sitting at like a solid 6 out of 10, but now it's a 5 out of 10. People seem to just hate on this show, and I think it's a problem because the fan service bros, we don't like the show because there's no fan service. And the people who want like this mommy show where mommy like mommies them. They don't get that either because the main character is like too much of a teenager to like really interact with his mom. And then they're the hardcore isekai bros who really want an isekai show that they can self insert as. But this is a total gag show. This is just a joke show. They don't take the isekai parts seriously at all. So essentially, I don't know who this show is for. It doesn't pander to any of the audiences that would be interested in this concept. Not to mention the fact that when the Blu-rays came out, I was hoping to see some nipples on the scenes that they censored, and they didn't even draw on the nipples. Like, they're just these bags of flesh. Like, for dudes, you know how they don't draw on the nipples? But if you don't draw the nipples for your fan service scene, then no one's gonna buy this. Nobody. Nobody's gonna buy this. Not even the fan service bros can save you now. I feel like fan service shows, and this is totally supposed to be a fan service show with some gag undertones, have gone really, really not lewd anymore. I don't know if it's like the influences from the West or something, or maybe it's just Japan just doesn't care about lewd shows anymore. But we used to get stuff like Sekai no Quasar or something, or we got shows like Manu Ichizoku, like the ones about the big breasts. We got these really, really hardcore fan service shows, and we just don't get those anymore. I mean, I finished this show. I actually finished Tsujo Kogeki Gazetai Kogeki de Nikai Kogeki no Okasan wa Suki Desuka. I finished this show, but I finished it mostly because Actually, I don't know why. why. Why did I watch this show? Oh yeah, it's because I like the character designs. I really liked the character designs in this show. Porta was cute, Wise was hot, uh, we got some really, really nice mommy shots. But other than that, I kept hoping. I kept hoping for some fan service every episode just because the animation was nice and I liked the character designs. But we never got any fan service. I would wait episode. Come on, this is the episode where we get fan service. The normies are all gone now. It's time. And no, 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 no. This episode is the episode where we're going to get fan service. No, no, no. This episode, we're finally going to get some fan service. And we never got any fan service. So this show is probably going to be relegated to the sands of time and probably be forgotten. The next one is Araburu Kisetsu no Otome Domoyo. I think I made it to like episode 10 or something. I made it quite far, but I ended up dropping it just because of how cringe the drama was. It's for like a certain audience that can enjoy and survive through the cringe. They can just watch and be like, yep, that's a, that's a stupid plot twist and that's a really dumb love triangle, but you know what? I'm invested at this point, but that's not me. I've been there. I know what it's like to be invested in these stupid love triangles. And let me tell you, it almost always goes nowhere. I saw up to the point where I think Sonozaki and her boy, they like made love or something. And once I got to that point, I was like, I'm done. You know, the, the one couple, the one couple I cared about, they won, they had their fun. I'm done here. Mari Okada, I don't need to see any more crazy love triangles. But I could definitely see why someone would enjoy it. But I think there are better, crazier love triangles out there that if you were interested in this kind of thing, you'd probably go back and watch those as opposed to watching this. In fact, you're probably better off just reading the manga because it's like the story but in a nice compact format instead of having to watch the cringe slowly unfold on screen. Whereas in a manga format, you can just see the cringe and be like, okay, this is bad. Scroll past like half the pages and be like, okay, now we're on a side character I care about. 
Anyways, the next show is Tejina Senpai, and Tejina Senpai, I finished this show. It's like a short form anime. I think each episode is only like 10 minutes long or 10 to 15 minutes long. It's quite short, and I'm not sure people will go back and watch this just because it really follows that dumb hot girl trope. And if you want the dumb hot girl trope, there are much better shows out there that have full on fan service. This had the fan service, but it was really toned down. Like, we didn't see any nipples or anything, we didn't see anything too risque. She was still pure. But at the same time, if you want to go further and you're interested in this kind of thing, you're better off watching something that goes like full on, you know? Instead of these half measures. The next show is Uchi no Ko no Tame Naraba Ore wa Moshikashitara Mao mo Taoseru Kamo Shirenai or Uchi Musume. I got to like episode 6 of this and I did not like Dale. I did not like Dale. I expected Dale to be more of this strong yet silent, noble yet kind father figure, but instead he was this whiny kid kind of teenager boy, and I guess that kind of makes sense because he's supposed to marry his pseudo daughter, he's supposed to marry Latina at the end of all the light novels, so it's less jarring if you come in it from this angle where something like Usagi drop where Daichi is just this full on father figure and then Rin wants to marry him, it's a little awkward, but in this case he's pretty much a kid raising a kid, so it's all good. I didn't like Dale. I straight up did not like his character. I didn't think he was funny. I didn't think he was interesting. I didn't like any of the scenes he was in. So I ended up just dropping the show at like episode 6 or something. It went to like some racy parts here and there, but for the most part it was still pretty much a cute girl doing cute things show. But I would enjoy something like Wata Ten or even something like Uza Made instead of this show. Not to mention, I heard this show is doing really, 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 really poorly in terms of sales. I think it's selling like hundreds of Blu-rays, like maybe 200 Blu-rays were sold or something. Like the sales are apparently really, really bad. And this is Maho Film, the studio that animated Uchi Musume. This is their first ever anime. And I think for a first attempt, it's really good. It's a great adaptation. It's a great, okay, maybe it's not greatly animated, but it's animated okay for what budget they did have. It's well voice acted. Everything seems fine. I just don't like the way this premise was handled. I think it could have been handled way better. I think it could have been a way more interesting story than what we ended up getting. I look forward to seeing what Maho Film does in the future. Hopefully, they'll be able to recover, bounce back, and maybe do something better next time. The next show is Mao Sama Retry, and I can kind of see people going back and watching this, but they're like way better isekais, way better self-insert isekais you could watch. Like how not to summon a demon lord, but Mao Sama Retry, I can't just dismiss it because the show had so much soul. Like you could feel like the studio really enjoyed what they were working on. I got the same vibes as something like Jashin Dropkick, where when you watch it, it's nothing special. It's not something a normie would watch. It's not something you would write home about, but it's definitely got soul. This is the kind of show that the animators, the voice actors, the whole production team enjoyed making, and you can feel it from watching the show. I really hope this show gets a second season just because of how enjoyable it was, how enjoyable the characters were, how slutty all the characters were, how into their own butts all the characters were. It was so fun. It was just plain fun, nice and simple. It's a fun show that you can watch and turn your brain off. There's like a bunch of other shows I can talk about like Carol and Tuesday, but I think I'll end it here with Copcraft. I want to talk about Copcraft because Copcraft, it must be a shame. It must be a total shame to have good source material but have no money to do the adaptation. Like you know that they can do this adaptation justice because the first episode is well animated, it's well done, the first episode is well paced, everything about the first episode is great, but it really goes way downhill. They did not have enough money, they did not have enough animators on staff to really do this show justice. Not to mention the fact that the studio got scared of certain parts of the Copcraft story. I believe in Copcraft, there's one scene about a school shooting and then there's like really kind of over the top lolly fan service and they really, really toned it down for the anime release. If you go on the Copcraft Twitter and you use Google Translate because you can't read Japanese, you'll see that they really encourage people that are interested in this kind of stuff to go out and seek the light novel and just read the light novel. That kind of irks me because you're not proud of the product you made. If you were proud of the Copcraft adaptation you made, you'd be like, you know what? Watch our adaptation. Watch our Copcraft anime. Don't read the light novel. You don't have to read that. Consume our version. And if you want more, the light novel exists. But instead, it's like they're driving people, they're driving potential customers away from their product and back to the light novel. It's like they don't even believe in the product that they made. 
I just want to say that I got this from Twitter and Twitter is not exactly the best place to really have some interesting conversations. It's better for more like witty retorts or like one-liners and that's what I got from that. So I'm sure the people at the studio, you know, they're doing their hard work. Not everybody doesn't believe in it, but the feeling I get from watching the Copcraft anime and reading the Twitter posts is it feels like they're not proud of their own work. Where something like Mao Sama Retry, you can feel the soul, you can feel the passion into the work that they've put out there. And they're proud of it. And I'm proud of them for making such a great show. Maybe one day the light novel for Copcraft will come to the West and I'll read it while I watch the anime and I can be like, this is bullshit, that's bullshit, that's bullshit, they skip that. But until that day happens, until the Copcraft light novel comes to the West and it's readily accessible, that's not going to happen. And I think I dropped this series at like episode 8 or something, or was it episode 6? I got pretty far. I definitely did get pretty far, but it got kind of drawn out. It was, the chasing was so bad. Anyways, I got a lot of homework to do, so I'm gonna get off the train here. I'll see you later, man. Fall season has technically already started with Legend of the Galactic Heroes, but I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what else airs next week. No, I'm not gonna talk about Sword Art Online. I'm not gonna watch that. Either.